And so, uh, let's see, last but not least, we need to remember uh, Debbie Hunter, and they're not here tonight, uh, him and Henry, her and Henry, and uh, the reason is, is because her son, Jason Carney, uh, he has been missing for 36 hours, and he uh, went, was called in to go to work, and uh, told the boss that he was coming into work, and he never showed up, they had no idea where he's at. Um, now, saying that, Obviously, she's in a frantic, but to say that, I mean, the words were told to me, pray for them. And then if you want to talk, call Henry's phone, not hers. And the reason is, is because hers, they're trying to keep open in case that happens. And also for the law back and forth, trying to find out. Hopefully, before we get out of here, you know, we get a call and everything's all right. But pray for them. We don't know what happened. So continue to pray. They are just so... Precious people, both of them, and so we need to pray for them as they go. All right. So tonight we are starting in a uh, a new book in a study, uh, and we are actually going into First Thessalonians. And I know uh, this was this has been uh, coming for a little while because of things happening. And so normally on Wednesday night we've done this several several times, uh, going through books uh, of the Bible. We've done Ephesians. We've done Isaiah. Uh, we've done several others in here that have been that way. And the last time, uh, for, for almost two years, we've been on Wednesday nights. We've been on what we call Hot Topics, which is what people ask to hear prayed about or preached about. And so we did those things. And we came down to a point where this is a good time to start it. And so we'll be in here uh, for a little while. Uh, so we'll be here for a while. So you got some great scriptures, and it, it's awesome. Uh, it is a New Testament book, and if you go to the back and just come back just to several books backwards, you'll find this book. It's, it's closer to the back than it is the front. Uh, and you really have not got to get past Hebrews very far from the back, and you'll be right there. So tonight is going to be the introduction, and this is great the way this felt, because next Tuesday night we will not have normal service. We'll have Vacation Bible School. And then the week after that, we'll be back up pretty close to schedule, okay? So uh, this is a perfect time for this introduction to do this to this book. So tonight, we won't get many verses, if any, because we're going to try to lay the groundwork down of where this is and uh, what's happening and when it's happening, okay? So first of all, uh, I drew a map up here, and I can't think of how many that have been here on Bible study. Monday night I said, you didn't draw this map. And I said, yes, I did draw this map. And they said, no, you didn't draw this map. And I said, you've been in Bible study. In Bible study, I've got five minutes to draw the map before you get here. Here, I was here all day anyway, and I drew this map in about an hour. So it looks better than normal, all right? You can actually see it, okay? So it is not chicken scratch. Now, before we get through, I'm not saying it's going to look like this, but... This is where we start, okay? So I want to at least, before we begin, I want to at least show you where we're talking about. And, and also then I'll tip off that, uh, of course, you know we go to Israel when last this January. We're going to get it next January. And I'll say this again. We're down to six slots that are left. So anybody wants to sign up, we need to do that as quick as you can. Uh, or I'm going to have to try to see if I can get a bigger bus if we do that. So to say that, uh, we're going there. But then the next trip we're going to make is to Greece and to uh, the seven churches that uh, are in Revelation, Revelation. So when we do that, that'll be either next, it'll be either, either late next year or the first of 2021. Okay? Yes, 2021. I think that's right. Yeah, okay. So anyway, to say that, uh, the reason I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm taking this map is to show you in the region where we're at, okay? So I don't know how far back some of you can see. If you, if you need to come up, move up, it's not going to bother anybody, okay? So the reason these are in blue is because the bigger lines are the Mediterranean Sea. So obviously we're talking about the Middle East, okay? And if, if we start here, this is Jerusalem. And I didn't draw the little, uh, the little sliver of land that's there, but basically it cuts right here. So you're talking about a little bitty piece of land 
that is in the middle of all this on the Mediterranean Sea. Now, obviously, this is Egypt and Alexandria. If you move up, you're at Antioch, which is in Syria. And then you move up into this area, and it is what used to be Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. And Istanbul is about right here. So you're close to this area. And if you move up, you're talking about the Black Sea, and above that, all through here is what is Russia and the remains of the USSR, even though it may be Ukraine or those areas, okay? And then obviously, if you move over here, I didn't draw it, but if you move over here, you're in the area of, uh, well, first, Saudi Arabia down in here, and then if you move over here, you're in Iraq and those areas, and Iran, obviously, is right here. So w this is the area we're talking about on this edge, okay? So if you move from here over, we're talking about here, Asia Minor stopping at this line. And obviously this is the Mediterranean Sea here. And as you get there, obviously, I put emphasis here because it's the main port uh, that's in that western Turkey area. And Patmos is right off there, about 90 miles off, which is where John wrote uh, the book of the Revelation of Jesus. So you're at this island. The churches that are here in the seven churches are all in a circle about right through here in what is called a Cilicia, the area in this here. So this is where the churches are remains are still on the ground, just on the eastern side of the Aegean Sea. Okay? So if we come down further, just to give you an instance, that makes this whole land through here Greece. So if you take that into consideration, it's what used to be called Macedonia. You'll know that name. This is where that was, okay? Which really in all reality, at the time of the Bible, this from here over, from Turkey over, was considered, if you want to call it that, Europe, okay? So we're moving into Europe as we go. And then obviously you move on over, and you got the Adriatic Sea and the Ionian Sea, and everybody knows this. That's the boot, and there's Italy, and that's Rome, okay? So to give you a bearing, we're close over here would be Spain, course northern Africa through Libya and all those countries down there in the bottom. Now, if we do that, a couple of things worth noting. Number one, down here uh, in what is called Achaia is where Corinth is, where we see Paul writing to the first and the second letter to the Corinthians, all right? So in the same area, and then if you move directly almost north of it, you'll see here uh, what we call Thessalonica, and we'll talk about the actual way to say it in a minute. Thessalonica. And the reason I did that is because it's right in this little jut area here. It comes at the top. And the only other city we need to talk about is Philippi, which is just right here to the right of that on the northern side. Okay? So bearing-wise, you got to understand that we're talking here in Thessalonica, we're talking about where uh, Paul would have written this letter. Okay? Now, not where he's at to write the letter, but who he's writing the letter to. All right? So when we see churches, uh, and, and you got two-thirds of the New Testament or close, that are going to be written to what we call the epistles to the churches. So you're going to have, you know, again, Corinth, Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Ephesus. Uh, you're going to have Romans. You're going to have Colossians. You're going to have Galatians. Uh, you're going to have all those books that are written to churches that were literally on the ground. And most of them would have been from here over through this area, with the exception of Rome being over here. So all of these that he's writing to in the book are going to be there. But when he writes them, he is not in the town that he's writing to. So he's not in Corinth when he writes to the Corinthians. Most people think, well, this is just something he's writing down. He's somewhere else when he's writing these letters. And most of the time, he's writing back to them after he's left these regions and gone somewhere else. So that's why, again, you see like 1 Corinthians, and, and I don't want to go too deep here, but I want you to understand, when you see the book of 1 Corinthians, he is in open rebuke to those people there. In fact, he is outside of Laodicea. It is the most carnal church in the Bible. And now Laodicea, everybody knows, is the church that's in Revelation, the last one in chapter uh, 3, and it is the church that it is neither hot nor cold, and the Lord says he wants to vomit him out of his mouth because he's sick of them not doing anything. And that's how bad that church is. And really outside of a pagan church, so I'm saying a quote-unquote Christian church, 
then Corinth is the most pagan of the bunch. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because he is writing the whole first book to them in open rebuke of what they're doing. He's telling them what they need to correct. Now, what's amazing is they weren't Baptists because if they were, he would have never had to write the second one back. Because the second one is a good book saying this you have corrected. This is what you've done. If it had been the first one, they would have got out, shifted and said, let him go where he's going to. But here it is again. They corrected after he wrote them and told them. Now, why is that important and why am I saying it? Because if you understand that, that Paul sometimes is writing to a church to commend them, sometimes he's writing to rebuke them. And so that means that every church, every church, every church, has at some point, somewhere, somewhere in it, or at some time in it, something that needs to be rebuked. Now the world don't want you to hear that, okay? The world don't want to nobody to bother them, and everybody is a perfect church. Can I just tell you, there is no such thing. There is not a perfect church. There won't be a perfect church till we're caught up to be with the Lord in the air, and we're at the judgment seat of Christ, and all of our the Lord's are given, and then we will be perfect. By the way, the church is not this building. The church is the people. So here's what I'm telling you. There is no perfect building the church as long as people are in it. You got me? So now, there is always time that there needs to be rebuke, and therefore there's always time to be exhorting. There's always time to give a time that we need to keep everybody in line. So that's why Paul writes letters that tells us how to walk and how to talk and how to act and how to do things on a daily basis and how to love our neighbors and how to be around other believers and then not only that, how to treat the lost and how to witness to them because we need to be steered in that direction. Now, I don't mean this bad, okay? But Jesus himself said that we are like sheep. You know what, those sheep are the dumbest animals on the world. Okay? So that means we've got to have open rebuke a lot of times. And here's what I'm saying is most churches do not do that anymore. Most churches never talk what Paul talks about in rebuke to the churches because that might hurt somebody's feelings or you might get politically incorrect and then you might get to where things might change in the church and somebody over here that may give may not give again and therefore they won't preach from the pulpit rebuke. Now I'm not saying that all of it's got to be rebuked but there is a lot of it that's got to be rebuked because in case you don't know this, you're a sheep. And in case you don't know this, you need to be corrected. And in the end, if you don't believe it, ask your wives. They will tell you quickly. Okay? So you hear what I'm telling you? We need to make sure that just because what people call hard preaching, there is none harder than Paul was. Paul was an absolute fireball. Paul told it just exactly like it is. So I'm going to get to Thessalonians in a minute, but just hold on, okay? So here's what I'm saying. We've got people today that the book of Romans in the first chapter talks about how we are supposed to act and how we are supposed to live and how we're not supposed to fall to the wayside with the worldly stuff, which in essence makes them turn from the natural use of a man or a woman. Now, I'm not picking this one out, but it's easy. That's why I'm picking it out, because the world has moved to this. So, Paul is absolutely as clear as crystal. He makes no bones about it. He says what it is, calls it out for what it is. He tells it, and by the way, it's New Testament. Okay? It's not all that the world wants you to believe. It's New Testament. So he absolutely rebukes the Romans for doing this. If you hadn't called it yet, homosexuality. Okay? So he absolutely open rebukes them. He absolutely, if he was preaching, 50 rows back, you're going to get the spit from this man because he is preaching. Okay? He is absolutely hammering down. As the old saying goes, he's peeling the paint off the wall. 
Okay? So he is literally preaching about this subject. Now, that is open rebuke. So what happened today? Here's what I'm telling you. We have gotten to where openly, openly, Southern Baptist churches have said that Paul is too harsh and needs to be toned down because we will never reach homosexuals if we stand on Romans 1. Now look here. The Bible is still the Bible. And I'm going to be honest. I see something new in it every day I read it. There's something that comes alive in it every time I open it up. I can read five words sometimes and I'm like, where in the world have you been? Because it, there it is, it shows up. But I'm telling you, I may read a chapter and if I'm at my desk, man, my head's hitting the desk because it will convict me. And if it doesn't convict me, then I'm either quenching the Spirit or I'm not saved to start with. Because the truth is here. And it's not based on political correctness and not based on because we don't want our toes stepped on. You see, everybody says, preacher, you stepped on my toes. Well, I missed. Because if really, if what the Scripture is saying, it's supposed to be stepping on your heart, not your toes. So you understand, here's what we're getting at. We want just a dabbling. And that's Scripture too. You know what happens? We have men heaping up sound doctrine with itchy ears. People don't want to hear the truth anymore. And so therefore, look, if you take out Romans, you might as well take out John 3.16. If you take out John 3.16, then nobody in the world won't be saved. Because you got to understand that the same book that Paul is writing in Romans 1 to the homosexuals is the same book in Romans 10.9 that says, If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God raised you from the dead, you'll be saved. So see, he's telling all this, but he's telling them that so that they can understand why they need salvation. You see, what's wrong with the churches in the world today is that they won't teach the rebuke anymore. They want everything to be lovely and popping you know, confetti out of balloons and everybody's strumming a harp singing kumbaya, but they don't want the truth where we have to walk different, talk different, act different, be different. You will never witness to anybody if you don't be any different than them. You will never be called out to be what you're supposed to be until you separate yourself as a scripture. Now, what happens though, you know, to a lot of folks when they do that? They become legalistic. And they become where you think, well, you know, I've got to wear a thin neck tie, it's got to be a white shirt, can't wear wire rimmed glasses, it's got to be black. The women can't wear anything that skirts down to their ankles. If they show their ankle, it's the Antichrist, then you're in trouble. You understand what I'm saying here? We don't need to go that way, okay? We just, we just need to stick to what this says. And I say this unapologetically, that's what we all need to be preaching. So when Paul comes on scriptures that rebukes, it's for a purpose. When Paul comes and exhorts and lifts up the church, like he did in the second, in the second book of Corinthians, hallelujah that you've done something right. So, so take both because we need both. So is anybody in here would be able to say that they've been on the mountaintop all their life? <laughs> Has anybody ever been in the valley all their life? So we need Scripture in the valley. We need Scripture on the top of the mountain. But we need it going up the mountain and we need it going down the mountain. So that means we've got to have it all covered. And so, by the way, Scripture says that all Scripture is given by divine inspiration of God. So that means that we should take all of it as a whole. So Thessalonians is one of those books, okay? So I'm stressing this because Paul's missionary journeys, if you go back, started up here and he came down across here, went here, Turn around and went back. Second trip, he goes up here and he comes here and basically stops at a place called Philippi, which is where, again, you know the church, Philippians, okay? So on his second missionary journey, he comes from his home, which is Tarsus, which is about here, close to Antioch. And so he comes from his home with uh, Silas and they arrive at a place called Troas. And as they get there, this place is not far from a town called Troy. Everybody knows that. You've heard of Helena, Troy. That's where that is. That's in Turkey. Okay? So they go there, and 
He gets what is called uh, the Macedonian call. Everybody knows that story, okay? But what happens is, is he thinks that everything is to go west. Now, isn't it funny when people landed in America, what they want to do? So, same thing happened over there. Paul wanted to go west. So, Paul didn't want to go west to find gold. He wanted to find gold in heaven. And the reason he wanted to do that is because he wanted to share it with people that had never heard the gospel. So, you got to get down something first. Paul, when he went into town, the very first thing he did was look for the jail. Okay? Because he's going to be put there shortly and he wants to know where he's got to go. The reason is, is because he knows he's going to get arrested. Everywhere he goes, he gets arrested. Everywhere he goes, he gets beaten. Everywhere he goes, just about, he gets shipwrecked. Everywhere he goes, he gets malaria. Everywhere he goes, I mean, man, in fact, over here in Pomphylia, which is about right here, they stone him to death. And he literally comes back. So they, they literally have a time there that they, man, I'm talking about everything from snake bite to seven times beaten. And I mean seven times, not one lash. I'm talking about the same thing Jesus got. Seven times. Shipwrecked at least three times. Probably more like five. On top of that, malaria three or four times. He can't hardly see. And everybody that he goes into the town is looking to put him in jail. Now, let me just say something. That's a missionary. That's a missionary. One that is absolutely fearing everywhere he goes, but not fearing because he knows who's on his side. So Paul, as he's going into these towns, again, he looks for the jail. The second place he goes is he looks for the synagogues, which are basically the small sections of churches that would be for the Jews. Because Paul is a Jew Jew, to back you up a little bit. Paul is the Benjamite tribe. Paul is one that came out of the Pharisees. And he was an unbelievable educated man. In fact, at the time, he was probably the second smartest man in the world. So he's underneath the teaching uh, of Gamaliel. He is in that sect of the Judaism where he knows it backwards, forwards, upside down. He knows it every direction. Paul is free. He speaks all languages everywhere. And you know the story, what happens to him. He's there and he's literally going to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem up to Damascus to either get them Jews to bring them back or to kill them. He's going to the purpose of bringing them back because they have turned to the church. And so he is persecuting them. And if you go back and look in Scripture, you, you can just get this. In Acts chapter 6, when Stephen is there and called to be a deacon, Paul is the one standing by holding his coat while they are stoning Stephen to death. So this is the man that had a past. And let me just say while I'm there, I don't want to preach because I'll never get through. But you hear what I'm telling you? That ought to tell you something. If God can save somebody that was persecuting the church and having people killed, surely the goodness he can save you. Here's a man that was brutal against the church. I mean brutal against the church. And yet, God saves him. You know what happens? He goes to Damascus, they leave it over the over the, as they get there, they get him up to that. It's back again. If they get to it, you know what happens? God shows up. He gets saved. He gets blinded. And then they have to push him over a basket to get him out because he's going to get killed. And from there, his life starts being an absolute miracle for God. But the comforts of what was in the world is gone. So as he's doing that, you know the story again. He goes off and, like I said, he takes... On the second journey, he takes Silas with him. And as he goes there, the second journey winds up at this city. And he calls for what is the Macedonian call. Okay? So by sea, he is about 125 miles across here to get to Philippi. And again, if you know the book of Acts, and all of you were in our study on Monday nights, the first convert in the European continent was a man, a girl, a woman named Lydia, which is in that town of Philippi. She's out by the water and she believes in God and she's a fearer of God but she's not a believer in Jesus Christ. And so Paul goes to them at the waist at the riverside and wins the first convert in Europe. Man, I, I, let, let me just say, could you imagine being Paul at the judgment seat of Christ? 
Can you imagine? Look, everybody in this building tonight, Paul's going to get a reward. Because if it had not been for him, you wouldn't have got it. Oh, well, wait a minute. Now, he didn't tell you nothing. No, he's been dead. But he told somebody else in Europe that told somebody else that told somebody else that told somebody else that told somebody else. You see, that's why we don't ever know until we get there what our rewards are going to be. Because you don't know who you may tell that may wind up winning five million. And a perfect example of this, you've heard this before, I'm sure, but you know the story. Mordecai Helm was a Sunday school teacher that was a, uh, went in to buy some shoes. And when he went in to buy some shoes, the man in the store was there. And as he's in there, he begins to talk to him. And I hope I got these names right. I think I do. Uh, but it was uh, Moody. And Moody is there in the shoe store. He becomes a preacher after he leaves. Mordecai Ham leads Moody to the Lord. Moody comes out, begins to preach in tent revivals, and as a 13-year-old boy, he wins somebody by the name of Billy Graham to the Lord, and Billy Graham leads millions to the Lord. Now look, Mordecai Ham has got some of the rewards of Billy Graham. Y'all want to shout now or wait? You got it? You understand what I'm talking about? So, so look, Paul is, is, is here and, and he is going to this city. And as he's done that, he's come in, he's got the first year pink convert. And now he's casting out demons of the slave girls. He's accused of interfering. Now this is just in a little bit of short time. Now. This is in a matter of two weeks. Okay, He's brought demons out of the slave girl. He's been accused of interfering with business of a silversmith who is making idols in the town. They bring him before the court through the middle of the town square, pull him out in front before the authorities. They lock him up and literally beat him half to death. And you know what happens in Acts 16? They sing praises in the jail. And all of a sudden, what happens? Doors swung open. The guard gets saved. Everybody in the jail says, don't go nowhere. He said, I'm waiting on them to come here. And they let him out because he tells the truth and they let him go out and tell him to leave town. So when he leaves there, here's what he said. The reason he really got out was because he said he was a Roman citizen, which he was. So they didn't want any kind of trouble there because you understand that Rome was only interested in Rome. The rest of this stuff is just outpost, especially here in Jerusalem. So the further you get to the east, the worst Rome cares about. Okay? As you get closer, though, look, we're getting closer. They're going to start worrying a little bit more because they don't want any revolts over here. So, the Roman government does not allow the Roman citizen to be arrested without an accusation. So, when Paul says that, their ears perk up like Dr. Spock because they're ready to hear and they don't want any part of the Roman government coming down on them. So they go out, he's allowed out, but here's what they tell him, you've got to leave town. So he does. So he leaves Luke, obviously, the doctor behind, which wrote the Gospel of Luke, which also wrote the book of Acts. And so he leaves him behind, and he went to go to the city, and he basically uh, winds up at... I'm Philippians, which is again about 30 miles over in this area. Okay? And, and basically he goes there and, and he's there, as he's there, he gets opposition again. And so therefore he turns another 30 miles down the road, leaves town again, they kick him out of town. He goes 30 miles down the road to a place uh, called Apollonia. He goes to Apollonia and then he winds up 35 miles from Thessalonica. He goes there, and as he gets there, then this is the town that he will eventually write this letter back to. So let's talk a little bit about the town. Because at this place, uh, it is the founded in 316 B.C., which is uh, founded by a man named Alexander the Great. Everybody's heard of him. And he found this, he named it after his sister, Sister's name was Thessaloniki. That's how you actually pronounce Thessaloniki. Okay? It is that because it's named after Alexander the Great's sister. Now, imagine, y'all realize Alexander the Great is pagan. 
Okay, Alexander the Great was ruthless. In fact, Alexander the Great dies in Pergamos because he uh, really they think he died of syphilis, but the reason they think he died is because he's in a drunken stupor because he is absolutely nuts still because he has nothing else to conquer. This man was ruthless, okay? And he's over there, and this is the city that his sister he named after, and he conquered, obviously, in Greece, okay? So now, this is on the busy town on the Roman road. Some of y'all were in Israel, and you walked on the Roman road. It's the same road that goes across through that to Rome from the Middle East. So it goes all the way over and winds up going all the way down to be, you can walk the remains of the road down. Amazingly, that has been there for probably now, we're looking at 2,600 years. So you understand, this is the same place we're at. Now Paul preached, again, first in the synagogue, and as he did, then he realizes that they're not going to listen to him. So Paul then understands in his own merit that he is called to go to the Gentiles. That's why I said, hallelujah. Paul, because if it had not been for him, we would have not got the gospel. So he goes and he goes in those now to outside and he begins to go into this city and, and it's so simple. He just begins to preach that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and then he rose again. And most of the time, that's all he says. Well, can I just tell you, that's all you got to say. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Why? So that you can have a way to get there. And we complicate it. We, we make this thing too hard. We, we try to get every kind of plan in the world, but Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the gospel. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's what it is. So you see, that's all we've got to trust and believe in to be saved. And Paul just preaches that. Now look, we've got people all over the world again today that are doing just the opposite. Man, we're hearing about how, how to make yourself a better you. You can't be better till you get to the cross. We're trying to talk about how to make our family lives better, and I understand that. But you can't make your husband and wife better till they get them to the cross. Well, you've got to make your kids get better. You can't make them get better till they get to the cross. Well, I want to be a better church member. There ain't no way you can be a better church member till you're saved. In fact, you shouldn't even be a member of the church till you're saved. Well, I want to learn how about tithing. You can't tithe till you get to the cross where you can know what he's done. Everything revolves around that. And we spend so much time talking about everything else and trying to enrich people. Look, Norman Vincent Peel can enrich people. I, I really, to be honest with you, I could care nothing about enrichment. What I want to get you to is right there. And then on top of that, I want to show you what you're supposed to do after you get there. And that is a job of what all of us are supposed to be doing as believers. We're supposed to tell the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how we're supposed to be living. That's all Paul did. He preached that, okay? So he taught that. And when he did, he also, though, still had respect to understand that if he did not have the Jews, so to speak, on his side, and when I say that, I'm talking about the Jewish church, and, and let me stop right there. I'm talking about the Jewish church that's in Jerusalem. And that Jewish church, which is the first church, was not run by Peter. It was run by James. And, and now look, and let me go a little bit further. The first church that's over here was long here before Peter ever got there. In fact, if you read your Bible, Peter never went there. I blow some minds, especially on Facebook, but it's not there. Okay? In fact, the only place Peter went was over here at Babylon. Why? Y'all in Bible study, y'all know this. 586, the Babylonians came in and took over Jerusalem, the whole temple, ransacked and took all the Jews captivity. And when they did, they were all over here in Iraq. And then when Persia comes in under Cyrus, he allows them to go back and build the temple at Jerusalem. And there's only about 50,000 that went back. In fact, it'd be exactly 49,820. Go look it up in Ezra. Okay? It's there. They go right back to this right here. And when he goes there, look, there's three million of them over there. That ain't 49,000. 
So what happened to the rest of it? Left over here, right? So look, the second largest territorial place of Jews in the world when Jesus is on earth is number one is Jerusalem, number two is Babylon. So Peter is called to go and be a apostle to the Jews. So where's Peter going? This is a Gentile church. Where's he going? Babylon. So now, while I'm telling you this, Paul's called to go to the Gentiles. Where's he going? Paul's wanting to go way over here. So you see, when we get this stuff, the reason I'm saying this is, Paul still wanted the stamp of approval of these people. Why? Because look, they're scared to death of him. He's just been having them killed, just been having them arrested. And now all of a sudden, they don't trust him as far as they can throw him. And besides that, the people out in the communities don't trust him because if they're Jews, they know what he's done. So they don't want this. Wait a minute, he's coming into the church. Exactly. So let's go this direction. Do you think the church is going to trust him much? <laughs> Nobody's going to trust him, right? So Paul's got it from every direction. So he's trying to still stay doctrinally sound and preach, but yet stay in with this group, so to speak, the Jewish church in Jerusalem. So when he does, when he goes to Thessalonica, he's going to get an offering to take back to Jerusalem at the Passover. Now why is he doing that when he doesn't even believe in that anymore? He's trying to show them that just because he's got Jesus does not mean that you can't still do the Passover. Now, wait a minute, now they're Jews. They've been converted to the church, okay? And they're different, but here's the point. We can have a Passover here every time we have service. Does it matter? Right? It doesn't matter. If we're, what do we remember? If we do it the right way, what do we remember? When the death angel went over. So look, you want to get real right here? Every time we have the Lord's Supper, it's doing the same thing. What do we remember? Here was the death angel passed over. What happened here? He did the same thing. The death angel passed over you by the cross, by what Jesus did. So look, when we do that, you, we're doing the same thing whether we believe it or not. It may not be the exact form that they've got. My point is, is Jesus is what matters. So what he did was to show the Jews, hey, Paul says, I become all things to all men. That didn't mean he bellied up at the bar and drank a beer with them to win them to Jesus. That didn't mean he went into the prostitute's house and slept with them to win them to Jesus. That meant that he was going to stand on the truth, yet tell them the truth, but understand that there are some things that does not matter. You got me? When I say that, I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm talking about things that you can still unify around Jesus. They were doing this here. They're unifying around Christ. The same way that we're here. So when Paul goes into these cities, that's what he's basically doing, okay? And so, mainly these are Gentile churches. And this, everyone that he goes through are predominantly filled with them. So, on his third journey, what well, let's say, on his second one, he left here and because the Jews showed up. Now, I'm saying the Jews here. Not the Jews here, but the Jews here. They showed up, and what happened again? Run him out of town. So he goes down to a place everybody knows called Berea. And Berea is about 60 miles away, and he took a ship and left there. And when he left there, he came down here to Achaia, which is a car. And when he got there, he wrote the letter back to First Thessalonians. So now he said, well, preacher, you talked 40 minutes, and yet he got to the book. But you tried to give me a history or a geography lesson. Well, here's the point I'm trying to make. Here's where he wrote this from, back here. Okay? And he's writing to them because he's left them. And when he left them, he left Timothy there too. Okay? So look, he left Luke, he left Timothy. So now he's down here and he writes back. And when he writes back, he wants to tell them. How great they've done. So, so here it is again. He's planting one of the biggest churches in the area there. And he writes this letter back. He's about 45 or 6 years old. And he basically, the whole theme of this book is going to be 
that Jesus is coming to get you. That's the whole thing of this verse. That Jesus is coming. Now what greater of a book can you get than that? Because it's going to be talking about how he's going to come to get his bride, which is us. Okay? So we're going to see the whole thing wrapped around that. And so let's look at it. Chapter 1, verse 1. Look who's with him. The only one. Paul, Silvanus, and then look. Timotheus. That's Timothy. Now I just told you. He left Timothy. But when did he leave him? On the second journey. He left there. On the third journey, he's back down here and he is there with him. Timothy has showed up from Thessalonica. So here he is. And he said, he says, Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Now, let's, let's say one thing about the last part of that verse. Have y'all ever had people that you just want to pray for you? I mean, Everybody in here has got somebody that you can call and say, you pray for You want somebody that can get down to business. Right? You want somebody that has been through it and can do it and can get down on it. Right? Well, imagine something. Multiply that. Here's a man who's been beaten seven times, shipwrecked three times, slave bit, put in jail everywhere he's been, cursed by the Jews, spit upon by people, mocked, beaten to death, stoned to death, Malaria three or four times. And look what he says. I pray for you. You've got to be kidding me. Man, if that guy was Baptist, he'd be crying for six months about what he's doing. But he's not talking about himself. He's praying for everybody. Can you imagine having Paul pray for you? My goodness. I mean, outside of Jesus, I don't know if I want to pray for you. Because he is one that has been through and knows what it is. So here's what he's saying. I have prayed for you. Not only did he pray for you, listen to me. I have prayed for you, he says, with all making their of you in our prayers. Not only did he do it, Silas did it. Not only Silas did it, Timothy did it. Now can you just imagine the powerhouse in those prayer rooms? I'm not, listen, this ain't going to be no 30 second Mumbo Jumbo, our Father, how great thou art. This is going to be getting down where the rubber meets the road. This is the prayer meeting. I mean, this is where we're going to get something done here because Paul is praying for them. Now imagine what that meant to this church. Can you just imagine here? We, we, we sometimes get hung up on this, okay? But Paul is in Carmel. And Paul's writing this letter back. Now imagine, it's not like today. So if you're going to write somebody a letter, the first thing you're going to do is put it here. On the text. I hate it. The reason I hate it is because you don't want nobody to say it when you do that. Well, yeah, but they write it down. Yeah, but you don't know the context. And you don't know what their anger is. And you can't see their face. And you don't know what they're doing. Man, I want to see somebody eyeball to eyeball where I can tell what they're... See, you can say one thing and really mean something else by the way you say it. If you text it, it all means the same. So, see, we get in our mind this. And then the second thing we do is email it. And then some of you still mail, which don't happen much. Okay? So, but here's what Paul did. They did not have the U.S. Post Office. They did not have Google. And they did not have cell phones. So now imagine here. The way they got it was by courier and it was by people. So you had people carrying parchments of paper that could rip, that had stains of water out in the open. I'm not talking about them living anywhere. I'm talking about walking. And now look, we're talking about a long way, either by boat or by land. And they're bringing that to them. And imagine, they do it in the middle of the town. So here they are. Can you imagine all the group comes up, Paul writes to this church, and they wrote out the struggle. And y'all got to get the picture right here. Look at how, can you imagine saying that? And then listen here. Paul, Silas, Timothy, to you, church, Thessalonica. 
which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in your prayers. They got revival in the city courthouse steps. Man, look, this is where the whole world's heralding this. And this is going to be what God's going to put for us to read 2,000 years later. Ain't that amazing that God can use that man to do that in front of you? And the words are incredible because he is again writing to this church and he's writing not only the church to the local body of believers, but he's also writing to you. So when he puts this down, this is indebtedly forever. You say, now wait a minute. We're going to have the King James Bible forever? We're going to have the Word forever. The Word's going nowhere. The Word is final. It is set. It's over. It is eternal. I didn't know that because the Word was made of flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. And He's always going to be. See, you know a great thing? You're only going to live as long as God does. Y'all want it? We need to stop. <laughs> Look here. You're only not only going to live as long as God does. You're also, if you follow His Word, you're only going to get the blessings that He gives. <laughs> not only are you going to get the blessings, look, you're going to get the chastisement when you need it. Now, how many of you have ever spiked their kid? I won't make you raise your hand. I'm just trying to make you. Okay, so look, you just mean I just can't believe I brought you. I can't believe you spanked your kid. I mean, I just can't believe my mama's waving profusely. Okay. <laughs> See, though, look, I can't believe y'all do that. I mean, I, you know, why would you beat somebody? I can't believe you spanked your kid. Why? You love them. So look, you're only getting chased when God gives you. Does God, you know why he chases you? Because he loves you, to mold you in what you're supposed to be. You know why God sends you through afflictions? Because he's molding you to make you what you want to be and what you ought to be. God says you can have whatever you ask if you ask it in my name. That's if you get in his will. He will give us whatever he's got. But man, we hop around and think everything is doomsday today. When we got all he's got. We've been adopted into the family. So look, when he says this, He's talking to you as much as he's talking to anybody else. So look, when you get grace, and look who you're getting it from, by the way, just to notice. God and Jesus. And look where you get peace from. God and Jesus. Look where you get saved by. God and Jesus. Look who seals you. Look, look who holds you. And that's double. And there ain't nobody can do anything about it. Because he's got you. See, when Paul writes this, he's telling you that. And not only that, it's a, it's a tribute to us to be able then to say, hey, Satan may attack us. He may disrupt us. But he can't harm us. He can't do anything about us. In fact, you know, all, all that could happen is we die. Because of that, I'm not where I'm going. You know all Satan can do to you now? What? Tempt you. He can't get your soul if you're saved. Let me just go further. He can't embody you if you're saved. So what you worried about? Oh yeah, he tempted me. I'm in the flesh. That's why you got to get in the grace and in the peace and be in God's word and stay steadfast and walk circumspectly and walk like God says to do and talk like what he says to do and be like he says to do. Because look, Satan's going to be in every corner. Satan is a thief trying to steal, destroy, and to kill you. He is trying to get rid of your influence. That's the only thing you can hit on. And how he does that? By tempting you. See, everybody says, well, God tempted me today. That's a lie. He can't tempt you. Satan tempts. God tests you. God sees where you are based on your spiritual growth so that he can mold you like the clay. 
Sometimes we pray our way out of what God's trying to get you on the other side of the door. See, what we want is all the gravy when God's got something over here that's bigger than the gravy. And you know, Bobby, God gave me some, man, he gave me some peach jam last night. Oh, it's good. And I'm telling you, I said, all we need, this was last night Bible study on Monday night, I said, all we need is some biscuits. Go make us some. Well, man, I'm telling you, you talk about good. That's good. But now, let me tell you one thing that's better. Biscuit and gravy. <laughs> and country ham. <laughs> you want me to keep going? That's better than just that. Now, Bobby Dodd's not here, but it's better than that. Okay? But look, I got something better than that. God's got something better than that for all of us. And we wallowing around out back here with a peach jam trying to say how good it is when God's trying to bless you with something over here that far exceeds anything you can ever think of. He, you don't believe that? It says it in John. He says, I come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. He's trying to do that. That's what Paul's trying to say in these verses. So, again, he, he knows that Satan's around the corner, but he doesn't fear it. Why? Because he knows that he can't go but so far. So what I want you to get out of this introduction is, is that Paul is in, so to speak, enemy territory from both sides. He's in this town, but he's here riding back to them, and he's going to begin to tell them how great it is that Jesus comes back, and how to look forward to what's going to happen. So in the upcoming chapters, man, it just gets awesome. Because as we get to chapter 4, we're going to see we're going up. And it ain't going to be long. So to say that, I, I want to say that today, I don't know if you saw this, but this will lead to what I'm talking about. David Fetterman is the ambassador to Israel for the United States. And they are absolutely in chaos. They have gone crazy over here. You know, the media is nuts. And they're going crazy in Iran and going crazy in, in the Middle East, the Palestinians, because he made this statement. That according to the new peace plan that Trump's going to fix the end unveil, that uh, he is saying that the Golden Heights and the West Bank are Israel's. I mean, man, they dropped a bomb on there. Might as well say that's what they've done. And those people are going crazy. Well, I got news for you. It's all theirs anyway. So look, what does that matter? It's setting it up. He said that in his plan, you know what happens? Two states. That's scripture. Ezekiel chapter 35 talks about there's going to be two states right before Jesus comes back to get the bride. And then when Jesus does come back, Antichrist is going to set up one. He's going to bring it back together with a peace. What look, y'all? We're eyelash close to the rapture. We're that close. So, so here's why it's so important to know Thessalonians. Because that's what he's talking about. And when he says this about grace and peace, he's commending them. So, look, I can commend y'all because there ain't no better church in this place. Amen. There's not any. And the reason is, is because we got people that pray. We got people that come to old-fashioned altars. We got people that don't care what nobody thinks. It's right. They walk, they talk, they live. They try to fill, fill scripture in front of our eyes. And that's why you can be a soul in the station. So, look, if that's true, let's just pretend for a second with this like Grace be unto you. Peace be unto you. And let's pray for each other like Paul. So, altars are open. Y'all come all they can. If you can't, you stay where you are. Just make sure and pray. Pray for again for the hunters and pray again for vacation policy.